Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Trinity Reformed United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. I want to thank you for joining us here in person as well as online and hope that you are truly fed by the worship of our God this day. Fellowship Time is sponsored by the hospitality team today, immediately following worship. And next Sunday, August 20th, the worship team will sponsor Fellowship Time. The teams are responsible for setup and cleanup, and a, scheduled, and a schedule is posted in the entranceway. We would like the teams to have coffee and hot water made prior to service so the fellowship can occur before and after service. Cups with lids are, have been purchased so the drinks can be brought into the sanctuary. And anyone, anyone can bring in a goodie for Fellowship Time. And there is a sign-up sheet for those items as well. As you can see, the new projector has been installed and is working wonderfully. That's the difference between laser and a light bulb. I want to thank Greg Hine and Don Hummel for installing the projector. Uh, Friday, we had two sections of scaffolding here and they were up on top and I was securely on the bottom, on the floor. Just handing things, yes. So I want to thank them for installing that projector and uh, it was quite, quite a feat. So, Eventually, we'll be able to get this one uh, replaced uh, as we collect money for that, and we'll have two of the same, and they'll be both laser and they beautiful, beautiful optics there. So we're really happy with that. And of course, as I said, speaking of projectors, we are raising funds for the second projector as the remaining one is the same age as the <clears throat> one that failed, and could, it could go any time as well. So please consider sending in an extra offering for a, a, this needed accessory for our worship time. We've gotten away from announcing uh, flower donations, so I'd like to get us caught up a little bit. On July 9th and August 6th, the flowers were donated by the Golsch family in memory of Betty and Ken Roberts on the 9th of July and Barbara and Ray Crawford on August 6th. Today, we are blessed to be able to use last week's flowers once again in memory of Barb and Ray Crawford. We are actively collecting for food pantry. Uh, items can be left on the table in front of the crying room at the rear of the sanctuary. So please consider dropping off some non-perishable food items for those less, worship, less fortunate than ourselves. And we're also once again collecting gently worn dress clothing and shoes for those going to court or for a job interview who do not have these access to these important tools for success. Uh, men's clothing continues to be needed. So if you have any men's clothing, be sure to bring those in that you, if you, that you like to get rid of. Grocery cards continue to be on sale either in Jubilee Hall after service or by ordering them uh, for pickup or delivery. This has been an amazing fundraiser for the church and one that helps us stay open and allows us to also continue our mission work in the community as well. So if you haven't purchased cards recently, we'd greatly appreciate your support to resupply these funds that are able to be used when they are desperately needed. Thank you. And if you know of anybody who needs assistance, Remember, our visitation team is ready to lift the spirits of those who truly need it. However, we could use some help on the visitation team, so please see Don Hummel if you're willing to visit our homebound or those in life care centers. And finally, as we prepare for worship, let us empty our minds of anything that would distract us from realizing God's presence and God's Holy Spirit during this time of worship. So let us now experience God's Spirit as we join together in the call to worship. Over the wind and waves, Christ comes to us. Do not fear to meet Christ here. We have heard the invitation. Our hopes have brought us together. The storms of life do not have the last word. Our faith keeps us from sinking. Our doubts lead to greater faith. Our losses upon us to greater possibilities. Let us call on God's name and give thanks. Let the hearts of all who seek God's God rejoice. We will sing of God's wonderful works. We will share with others marvelous deeds. The opening hymn is Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above, number six in the hymnals or on the walls.
Please join me in the opening prayer found on the walls and in the bulletins. We seek your presence, holy God. Break through all our pretense that we might sense the vibrant energy embracing the whole universe, yet know ourselves to be personally loved within the vast expanse of space and time. How amazing are all the miracles of life that surround us. We praise you, we thank you, we bow in awe before you. In this hour, we pray that our faith may be reborn, our trust deepened, our commitment expanded to meet the challenge of our time. Um, yeah. Please be seated. We profess our faith in God, yet we rely more heavily on our own ingenuity. We say we believe, but our lives seldom show confident trust. We want to care as Jesus did, but we're often ready, as were Joseph's brothers, to sell off those whom we disagree. Who can save us from ourselves? So let us confess our sins by reciting the prayer of confession found on the walls and in your bulletins. God, we confess that we are dreamers more intent on our own importance than on your vision for us. We like our favored position on this earth, and we are jealous of those who have even more than we. We want to walk on water before we have even learned to stand upright on the land. We want to rise above others rather than reaching out with helping hands that all might be uplifted by you. We pray for pardon, for greater insight, for another chance to live and serve with faithfulness. Amen. Let us now confess our personal sins in silence. Lord, hear our prayers. O oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? Take heart, do not be afraid. The harsh winds will abate, the seas will not overwhelm. The treachery of some will not wipe out the good God intends. Everyone who calls on God's name will be saved. Remember God's wonderful works and share the good news. Let all humankind praise God. Good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? Are you awake this morning, Victor? No, not yet. Okay. All right. I'm, th I'm that way sometimes too. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, that was a question. When your clothes, when they get dirty, what do you do with them? Do you throw them away or do you wash them? You wash them, yeah. Well, you know, when we sin or make mistakes, right? What are we to do? What are we to do? Are we to ask forgiveness? Or are we just to feel sorry for ourselves? What do you think? Yeah, ask for forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. Now, when we make mistakes, when we sin, it's kind of like making our hearts dirty or stained. And in order to get our hearts clean again, we confess our sins or our mistakes to God. And then what happens? What happens when we confess our sins? You think, Andre? You become clean, yes, you become forgiven, right? Yeah, God forgives us our sins. 
kind of like washing our clothes and getting them clean. God forgives us and our hearts are cleaned too. Do you know what that's called? It's called grace. Grace. Grace is, it's God's grace or God's gift to us. You see, when we sin or get our hearts dirty, we are separated from God. Our relationship with God is broken. God's grace or gift to us allows us to be forgiven and our relationship with God is made good again. Sin breaks that relationship and forgiveness restores our relationship with God. And you know what? That works with God and it also works with other human relationships too. And that's my challenge for you guys. I want you to confess your sins or your mistakes to God in prayer so that your relationship with God can stay strong. But I also want you to forgive those who hurt you so that your relationship with them can be restored as well. So you think you can do that? Yeah, I bet you can. Let's pray. Forgiving God, help us restore our relationship with you by confessing our sins or mistakes that separate us from you. And help us to forgive others who hurt us and cause a separation in our relationship with them so that we too can restore those broken relationships as well. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all very much. Our lesson for this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 37, verses 1 through 4, and verses 12 through 28. The story of Joseph and his brothers combines two sources which might explain some of the oddities and contradictions. But the power of the story shines through, full of intrigue, tragedy, and ultimately forgiveness and reconciliation, beginning in verse 1. Now his brothers went to pasture their flocks near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at, at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He, he answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, what are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? The man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, let us not take the, his life. Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with the sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up 
lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Here ends our first reading. Our gospel lesson is from the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Life is full of storms. When we focus on our immediate situation, we can falter and fall. Trusting God, however, can calm the stormiest of seas, beginning in verse 22. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far off from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why do you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and, they, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Blessed are those who hear the word of our God and believe. Let us pray. God of relationships, help us to discover the wisdom that teaches us how to love our neighbor as ourselves. Help us to build our relationship in this thing we call church, as we pray that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth might be pleasing and acceptable to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, the story of Joseph is one of the Hebrew Bible's most finely crafted and engaging pieces of literature. Here we see the use of foreshadowing, wordplay, irony, suspense, and vivid characterizations, as well as the riches to rags back to riches story of Joseph's life. Joseph's story, told from his perspective, sets the stage for what is to follow by reporting that Jacob, Joseph's father, had settled in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived as an alien. Three generations of family history lie behind this story of the call and immigration of Abraham to a promised but unknown land, as well as the struggle to secure a foothold in this new home of by Abraham's son, Isaac, and the fulfillment of the promise by one of Isaac's sons, Jacob, who ends up being Joseph's father. You see, because the Israelites themselves had once been resident aliens, their regard for the vulnerable and marginalized was shaped by that collective memory of being an immigrant in a foreign land. Recognition of the vulnerable position of resident aliens is evident in their inclusion with widows and orphans in the classes of persons for whom protective provisions had been made in ancient Israelite society, such as treating the resident alien in your midst as a citizen and mandatory caring for the widow and orphan who were the most vulnerable of Israel's society. <clears throat> These special classifications for the vulnerable are remarkably woven into the story of jo jo Joseph. Just as special consideration or favoritism for the vulnerable is given, the same can be said for the favoritism of Joseph by Jacob, his father, 
due to his vulnerable status. Joseph's unique dreams sets him apart from his brothers as special, but his coat, his coat also set him apart in a much different way. The tunic of palms and soles, or the tunic of hands and feet, is a long sleeve flowing garment with ample ankle length skirts. This version of the garment was ordinarily worn by women. And Joseph's description as handsome and good looking used Hebrew words much more commonly used to describe female rather than male beauty, making this reference one of the several subtle suggestions of Joseph's unmanly nature in the story. So my first question for you today is how do you treat people who are different from you, such as those who don't look like you, love like you, or were born where you were born? How do you treat people who are different from you? Anyway, we have an online response. It says, I try not to judge, but I think that it's a natural reaction for us to judge others. Not judging people and putting yourself in their shoes puts things in perspective for myself. So not judging and putting yourself in their shoes tends to help put things in perspective. So how do you treat? How do you treat people who are different? Think about it. Here, here at Trinity Reform UCC, what are we? What are we known for? We are what? Open and affirming. We're open and affirming church, which means we accept eight different categories of people. Let's see if I can name all of them. We have age, right? Gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, LGBT status, disability, and transgender rights or transgender identity. Okay, I think I got them all. Yes. So we accept everybody, anybody who is seeking God, seeking or, or just wants to find out a little bit something, wants to investigate our welcome here. And we welcome them with open arms, not judging them, not putting them down, but embracing them as children of God, human beings, and treating them the same way. You see, this resentment of Joseph by his brothers set the stage for their upcoming plans to kill him. In fact, the plot to murder Joseph is modified twice. First by Reuben, who proposes that the brothers throw Joseph into an empty pit rather than kill him. And then Judah persuades his brothers to spare Joseph's life altogether and make a profit in the bargain by selling Joseph into slavery. And he sells him to the Ishmaelites and Midianites who were separated by force from the chosen line of Abraham. Remember, the Ishmaelites are those who are the descendants from Ish of Hagar, Abraham and Hagar are the Ishmaelites. Ishmael was the son of Abraham who came from Hagar. And that line is what? The Islamic line, the Muslims. Same father, Abraham. Okay. <clears throat> These marginalized people, the Midianites and the Ishmaelites, saved Joseph from death and enabled him in turn to save his own people from death in the future. As the story goes, Joseph ends up supplying grain that Israel desperately needs during a prolonged drought, thus saving his father and his brothers. But that's getting ahead of the story. So what are we to take from the story about, what are we to take about a story from, about sibling rivalry that goes awry and a society that, that was protected even though they were immigrants in a foreign land. Well, we might consider that Abraham and Isaac were resident aliens in the land of Canaan. And it was their treatment by those who lived there that led the Israelites 
to adopt the law that protected resident aliens as citizens in the same manner that the Israelites protected the widows and the orphans. Or maybe the story is about sibling rivalry that can, get pretty, can have some pretty harsh consequences. I can remember my brother making the mistake of coming up the hill at me when I was mowing grass. And the lawnmower went at him going down the hill. <laughs> sibling, sibling rivalry can be pretty, have pretty bad consequences. Just as, just as the brothers wanted to kill Joseph, we had those same things happening here in Bloomsburg. <laughs> or, or maybe, maybe it's about resentment of those who are different than ourselves. And it's not a really pretty sight. So, what are we to get out of this passage? What are we to get out of this passage? By a show of hands, is it, I'm going to give you some, going to give you some choices here. Is it sibling rivalry is bad? Or is it how we treat resident aliens or immigrants? How we're to treat them? Or is it how we should treat those who are different from ourselves? Or is it all three? So, is it just number one? Is it just about sibling rivalry? Is it just about treating resident aliens as citizens? Is it just about treating those who are different from ourselves with honor and respect? Or is it all three? Yeah, all three. Yeah, it's about the warnings about sibling rivalry. It's about treating resident aliens and immigrants properly. And it's about treating those who are different from us in the right and proper way. See, I ask this question because those same issues in the scripture passage from over 2,000 years ago are exactly what we are dealing with in our society today. Today, 2,000 years later, we have the same exact problems. Joseph's special ability brought, a, brought about resentment by his brothers, as well as his different appearance or mannerisms created even more animosity, let alone that his family were resident aliens. I mean, this is the same problem of how immigrants are being treated at our borders. Remember when there were news reports about immigrants being held in large capacity cages? Children not receiving medical treatment and dying? Just this past week, we had a child who was being trans transferred from Texas to New York who dies en route on the bus. And now there are governors like I just stated, sending immigrants to other states with no warning, no coordination for their care or their housing. I'm not sure how you could say that that's treating resident aliens or immigrants as citizens. Yet, there are those who call the United States a Christian nation. And to be a Christian nation, aren't we to follow the teachings of Jesus the Christ? I mean, do we do that when we treat immigrants as criminals? Aren't we to treat the resident alien as a citizen? Aren't we to love our neighbor, not judge others? And as I taught the children today, forgive. Not only ask for forgiveness, but give forgiveness to others. And yet it certainly appears that we continue to strip away human rights from the marginalized citizens of our country. Those who don't look, act, or love like we think they should. I honestly believe these are some of the reasons that mainline churches are seeing declines in their membership and volunteerism. Too often the outsiders see only hypocrisy. To be Christian, to be spiritual, to be just about any religion on earth, you usually follow the tenets of that faith or belief system. And I think we do that here. I think we do a very good job of it here. You know, it's said that most, almost every religious organization on earth today believes that you should treat people the way you want to be treated. That's called the golden rule. 
Yes, the golden rule is held as a tenet of most every religion on earth in some way, shape, or form to their religious belief structure. And isn't that what we are to do as Christians, as disciples of Christ, those with moral and ethical values? Unfortunately, sometimes I don't believe we always do. That's what makes us human. That's why God had to provide forgiveness. And that is why people need church. They need church to practice those relationship skills so they can learn how to treat people with respect, with dignity, and with honor as human beings, as children of God. I've said it many times before that the Bible is basically a guide to relationship building. Building a relationship with God and building a relationship with others. And when we get together, we need to practice loving each other, admonishing each other in loving ways, and even holding each other accountable to the ways of our God and Savior in everything we do and say as Trinity Reformed United Church of Christ, as disciples of our Savior, as followers of Jesus. That, my friends, is how we live as disciples of Christ. Amen. Let us continue our service with our hymn of response, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, number two, 628 in the hymnal, on the walls and on the screens, plural. Please be seated. <clears throat> this is time of our service. I want to remind you to take notes of the people mentioned in our joys and concerns and join your list today with the one from last week and place it on your refrigerator, nightstand, or coffee table, anywhere that will remind you to share God's love with others through your prayers. This is a vital ministry here at Trinity and one that has had some amazing results. Today, I'd like to let you know that Ted Hawk called me on Friday afternoon to let me know that his wife, Benita, fell and broke her upper arm, her left arm. It's a spiral fracture from the socket all the way down to the elbow. She had surgery on Saturday and a plate was placed in her arm and she should be coming home very shortly. They were hoping, they were, they were hoping to come up in about two weeks and they may have to delay that just a little bit. So prayers for comfort, healing, 
and God's embrace on her and on Ted. I'd like to let you know that Sue Fox has finally been moved to Sunset Ridge Nursing and Rehab. She was delayed being transferred due to having an episode of AFib. And then there was an explosion at Sunset that prevented her from being transferred. On Thursday, she finally made it. Uh, please keep Sue in prayer for continued healing and a quick recovery. And of course, anyone who can help with transportation for her daughter, Heather, it would be greatly appreciated. I'd also ask that you please keep Lori Sober and her Hawaii family in your prayers, thoughts, or heart's thoughts and prayers. While Lori's stepmother was unaffected, other than having family stay at her house and setting up tents in her front yard for others, Lori has three sets of family members who lost everything. And six members of her family are still missing. So prayers that they be found safe and that our generosity might help them rebuild. And as always, I remind you to send in your joys or concerns to us through email, text, or phone, and we'll be sure to include them in our next service. Now let us pray. Glorious God, whose word took on flesh in Jesus and whose saving grace can be known by all who believe in Christ, open our hearts and minds to encounter your word personally that the church may more fully express our identity as the body of Christ, carrying on the mission Jesus began, assuring a frightened world of the power of love. As today we ask mindfully that you watch over and comfort our friends in Christ, such as our homebound, those in life care centers, those on our prayer list, as well as those that were named here today. And we celebrate with you the saints of this church that serve your people with such love. Now in a moment of silence, we ask that you hear those prayers that are simply too private to speak out loud. Lord, hear our prayers. May we keep these special people in our minds and in our hearts and especially in our prayers as we go through this next week. And let us pray the prayer that Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Got a little darker. <clears throat> like Joseph, we have been entrusted with our ruler's possessions. We are stewards of all that God places in our hands, our time, our talents, our accumulated treasures, life itself. Our offering is not just about tithes and gifts for the church's missions. It is about re rededication of all of life in Christ's service. So let us consider going to the church's website at www.trinityreformeducc.org and present your offerings to God online or by sending in your church envelopes as best you are able. Those who are here in person can drop off their offering in the basket at the rear of the sanctuary. Please join me in the blessing and commission found on the walls and in your bulletin. Go out to share the good news without favoritism. Meet both friend and enemy with forgiveness and grace. God's word is on our lips and in our hearts. We face a dangerous world with assurance and trust. Take heart, do not be afraid. God is with you wherever you go. 
We are assured of God's presence and protection. We believe God's help is always available. Let faith grow as doubts are explored. Christ invites us to follow where God leads us. We will listen for God, Christ's invitation. We will follow where God leads us. Amen. Now hear this pastoral benediction. How do you feel about immigrant, the immigrant problems or the, how do you feel about the immigration problem we face at our borders? Do you apply the guidance of Jesus' teachings to them? Or do you follow the ways of our politicians who want to secure the borders by building a wall? How do you feel about LGBT rights, programs for the poor and vulnerable of our society? The answers to those questions should shed some light on how closely we follow Jesus' teachings and the Bible's instructions for our lives. May we be true disciples of our Savior by following his teachings and loving our neighbor, whoever they may be. Amen. Let us conclude our service today with our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision, number 595 in the hymnal, on the walls and on your screens. peace directly to Jubilee Hall for fellowship time and look for the new discussion cards on your tables.